beat hell out of me, and I feel limp anyway. Let's go in. Just a nip of champagne. Do you know the awful thing is I would like champagne very much. I'll have some champagne too. Very good, sir. What a life of pleasure. Roses. Half an hour with a female pugilist. And now champagne. I wish you wouldn't keep going on about the roses. It wasn't my idea in the first place. Somebody sent them to Celia. Oh, that's quite different. That lets you out completely. But it does make my massage worse. Well, I did have the barber shave me in my room this morning. I'm glad about the roses. Frankly, they were a shock. They made me think we were starting the day on the wrong foot. All the next day, Julia and I spent together without interruption, talking, sometimes scarcely moving, held by the swell of the sea. After luncheon, the last hardy passengers went to rest, and we were alone, as though the place had been cleared for us, as though tact on a titanic scale had sent everyone tiptoeing out to leave us to one another. We thought Papa might come back to England after Mummy died. Or that he might marry again. But he lives just as he did. Rex and I often go and see him now. I've grown very fond of him. And Sebastian? He's disappeared completely. Cordelia's in Spain with an ambulance. Bridie leads his own extraordinary life. He wanted to shut Bride's head after Mummy died. But Papa wouldn't hear of it for some reason. So Rex and I live there now. And Bridie too? He has two rooms next to Nanny Hawkins. Part of the old nurseries. One meets him sometimes coming out of the library or on the stairs. I never know when he's at home. And now and then he suddenly comes in to dinner like a ghost, quite unexpectedly. He's like a character from Chekhov. <laughs> you know, Charles Rex has never been unkind to me intentionally. It's just that he isn't a real person at all. He's a few faculties of a man highly developed. The rest simply isn't there. He couldn't imagine why it hurt me to find out two months after we came back to London from our honeymoon that he was still keeping up with Brenda Champion. I was glad when I found that Celia was unfaithful. I felt it made it all right for me to dislike her. 
Is she? Do you? I'm glad I don't like her either. Why did you marry her? Physical attraction. Ambition. Everybody agrees she's the perfect wife for a painter. Loneliness. Missing Sebastian. He loved him, didn't he? Oh, yes. He was the forerunner. She told me, as though fondly turning the pages of an old nursery book, of her childhood. And I lived long, sunny days with her in the meadows, with Nanny Hawkins on her camp stool and Cordelia asleep in the pram. She told me of her life with Rex and of the secret, vicious, disastrous escapade that had taken her to New York. She too had had her dead years. At first I used to stay away with Rex in his friends' houses. He doesn't make me anymore. He was ashamed of me when he found I didn't cut the kind of figure he wanted. Ashamed of himself for having been taken in. I wasn't at all the article he bargained for. He can't see the point of me. But whenever he's made up his mind there isn't a point, and he's begun to feel comfortable, he gets a surprise. Some man or even woman he respects takes a fancy to me, and he suddenly sees there's a whole world of things we understand that he doesn't. He was upset when I went away. He'll be delighted to have me back. I was faithful to him until this last thing came along. When, before dinner, she went to get ready, I came with her, uninvited, unopposed, expected. I recalled the courtships of the past ten dead years, how knotting my tie before setting out, putting the gardenia in my buttonhole, I would plan an evening of seduction and think, at such and such a time, at such and such an opportunity, I shall cross the start line and open my attack for better or worse, this phase of battle has gone on long enough, I would think, a decision must be reached. With Julia, there were no phases, no start line, no tactic at all. I'll see you at dinner. 